Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Caroline Heldman, the Executive Director of the Representation Project. The Representation Project is a nonprofit that was founded by Jennifer Siebel Newsom over a decade ago that uses films and campaigns to challenge damaging gender norms and stereotypes. And I'm so excited today to be interviewing Jason Rosario as part of our Boys Will Be Boys campaign. Uh, this is a campaign that seeks to expose how restrictive and traditional masculinity harm boys and men, and to create a space where boys and men can achieve their full human potential. So boys will be boys, which means they will be anything and everything they wanna be. Uh, in short, this is our love letter to boys and men. So before we get into questions with Jason, let me tell you a little bit about this incredible human being. Uh, Jason Rosario is the Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer at BBDO, a leading global advertising and communications company. Prior to BBDO, Jason worked for more than a decade with top clients, including Netflix, Yahoo, Spotify, Verizon Media Group, and Huffington Post, helping brands identify inclusive practices at the enterprise level. And in 2017, he founded a very important organization the Lives of Men. This is a social impact creative agency that, that explores themes around masculinity, mental health, and culture. And Jason has facilitated numerous workshops on allyship, psychological safety, race, and culture. You can see he is a leading expert in this area and has a unique vantage point as someone in the advertising world. Um, prior to that work, Jason worked for Verizon Media Group as a manager of global diversity and inclusion and was the executive producer and host of the Yahoo News original web series called Dear Men. If you haven't uh, checked out that series, you really should. He has a background in financial services and is a graduate of NYU's Stern School of Business. Uh, Jason also sits on the board of Made of Millions, a nonprofit organization changing the negative stigmas around mental health. And in 2019, he was selected as one of Black Enterprises' BE Modern Man of Distinction. Um, in 2022, he was named DEI Executive of the Year by Ad Color that recognizes inspiring leadership. Uh, this is the highest award you could possibly get as a DEI leader in this space. Um, welcome, Jason. It is so good to be speaking with you today. Thank you, Caroline. It's always a pleasure. Um, and it's always weird to hear your bio read out loud that way. And you're just kind of sitting there and nodding because, you know, um, but but it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I'm excited to get into this dialogue. It's a little bit like, who is this person and who led these lives and where are we today? So that is a great segue to our first question, yeah. which is, tell us about your pathway. How did you get into health and masculinity's work and why is this such a passion of yours? Yeah, um, I think there's two answers to that. There's a, a practical answer and then there's more of a spiritually grounded answer. I'll probably give you a blend of, of both. <laughs> um, you know, so I grew up the oldest of seven kids, um, product of an immigrant family. Uh, my dad wasn't a consistent presence in my life growing up. So my journey through manhood and masculinity uh, was informed in large part by the women in my life, uh, whether it's my mom, uh, my daughter, my sisters, cousins, partners, et cetera. Uh, so, and then also through negative confirmation, right? Seeing men around me in my neighborhood uh, and then saying, that's, I don't want to be that, right? And so that kind of negative confirmation was, was uh, those two things were, were what propelled me. Um, and so I've also been always, I think, a, a man on a mission, if you will, right? A man on a journey of rediscovery or reconnection, um, meaning I wanted to kind of embark on this journey to explore what it was about me and my personhood and my in my spirit that have been lost and kind of obscured through through traumas right and kind of lived experience and so I wanted to reconnect all of that and so that's what brought me to this work um you know without my dad kind of or having uh consistent male figures in my life um and having questions I wanted to create a vehicle that served as my own healing or vehicle for my own healing first and foremost that was the life of the lives of men uh, and then in that process, I realized that, you know, of course, I'm not the only man going through these uh, things and experiences. And so thought that I, you know, maybe should share this. Uh, and so the, the blog or the, the platform uh, evolved in many ways and became what it wound up being towards the end, which is, you know, kind of a social impact agency that kind of connected all of these concepts uh, through content, through culture, through events, uh, seminars, et cetera. So, Jason, you 
you talk about this being this work being a vehicle for your own healing and yeah. this is it ties into the next question about the evolution of manhood um more broadly the evolution of your manhood maybe a topic which you have done extensive work on um talk to us about how manhood has evolved and what harms and challenges still exist for boys and men it's interesting because you know the, the conversation around manhood manhood and masculinity um seems to be a new one right and and i think it entered everyone's uh lexicon and, and consciousness uh, around the me too and kind of times up era a few years ago um but it's not it's not a new conversation as you know right it's it's a conversation that has been as as old as time um so when you consider for example um pre-colonial um tribe the role of, of men in pre-colonial you know uh, africa and tribal communities you know in those communities uh it was very very much a matriarchal community right with women holding the power and you know making decisions around uh, wealth transfer and family lineage etc uh, and so only uh, after colonial uh, influence was when kind of this introduction of patriarchy happened and we start to see that shift you know you see it you know in ancient Greece with kind of the ways that the Greeks mythologize in their stories kind of you know told stories of men you know as heroes and and women as you know damsels in distress or or wicked goddesses looking to kind of exact their revenge on unsuspecting uh mortals and then and then in the 20th century right you see this uh new norm kind of adoption of you know men um working outside the home and then women being homemakers right and so that's kind of the the latest evolution um, of manhood and masculinity now. So I think when you look at where we are today, it's interesting because there's so much discourse around what does it mean to be a good man? Uh, what does it mean to be a man? And then what does it mean to be a good man? Um, and then I think, you know, when you think about everything that uh, we we're faced with, right, the conversation around toxic masculinity and mansplaining and patriarchy, all of these words are so overused, but we don't really understand what they mean. And I think whether we're talking about boys and, you know, boys, kind of the crisis of, of boyhood right now, the lack of connection that they're experiencing, um, you know, the lack of, of opportunity that they're seeing, whether it's, you know, in, in the area of uh, education or jobs or even in love, when you see, you know, women and young girls graduating at, at higher rates from college than young men, you start to realize that there is a real crisis of of boyhood, boyhood and masculinity. Uh, and so what does that mean? That means that we're not there, we, we don't live a, in a world where young men and boys are seeing opportunities for themselves to really self-actualize. Um, and I think all of that is exacerbated by kind of the ways that society, you know, bears down on men and boys uh, and really teaches us uh, what is acceptable and what is not, you know, and how we show up in our lives, whether it's with, you know, the women in our lives, you know, with, with, in our communities more broadly, right? I'll just say that. And so I think that's really the challenge that we're seeing right now is that men and boys are suffering from a, a ton of different issues, whether it's lack, lack of connectivity, connectivity, um, opportunity, relationships, uh, and I say all that to say, um, and I'm not saying with that, that, you know, there's, it's, not ignoring the real plight that women face uh, still very much so, right? But there is something to be said about uh, what men are experiencing in real time. Mm, well, and to follow up with that, what does it mean to be a good man, Jason? <laughs> that is the question. <laughs> um, and I think the word good there is is a bit of a trick. You know, it's a misnomer, right? Because it's all subjective. But, um, you know, I, I, for me, I guess my definition of, of a good man is someone who has taken the time to really interrogate himself uh, and, and understand um, all of all of his aspects and all of his side to shadow side as well as his kind of forward facing side and and really wanting to take stock on of that and taking responsibility for the ways that he shows up both professionally and personally um someone who uh goes beyond reading the books and highlighting all the things and really takes an opportunity to act those things, right? So for me, a good man is someone who has probably read a great book around healing and, and masculinity, but then when confronted with a real decision, actually makes that decision, right? It really walks that walk. Uh, it's something that I pride myself and really try to, to live um, by on a daily basis. Um, someone who is going to be, who's going to understand when to be 
kind of this uh, strong and, and stoic, if you will, but also when to lean into tenderness, when to lean into softness. Um, I think there's some, something beautiful when you see a man who is able to toggle both um, and, and has the emotional intelligence to understand when what is required and when. Um, and so I think those are just some beginning thoughts of what I think a, a quote unquote good man is. Um, but it really is just someone that's self-aware to, to start off. Well, and let's talk about how we create good men, right? Uh, in your series, Dear Men, you talk a lot about how boys actually need more love, not more discipline. Um, can you speak about why this love approach is so vital? Yeah, love is my favorite word in the dictionary. I think it's, uh, you know, it's so nuanced and, and I don't talk about it in terms of just romantic love. And it's, you know, such an ethereal term. It's like, oh man, I wish love can just come down and rain and cover me, right? Like in the red that you're wearing, I love it. Um, but it's it's not as, I don't think it's as mysterious. I think it, when you think about love as a verb, uh, as an act, as a doing, as an offering, I think it becomes much more real to people and, and much more, and you become much more responsible to it. Um, and so what do I think, why do I think love is important? I think it's important because, you know, what I just described at the top, as far as what I think boys are suffering from, uh, it's a lack of attention. It's a lack of uh, bring of closeness, right? It's a lack of um, care. And I think love is probably the primary solution to that. If you can show a young man that you do care and, and love him and, and really um, are committed to uh, being a, a, a vehicle or, or a source of inspiration or information, whatever it is, I think it goes a long way. And so if you think about what we're asking men to do, in society today, uh, which is to be more aware, to be softer, to be more emotive, to be much more in tune. I think love is the vehicle that unlocks that, you know, and um, and vulnerability as well. So not to take a page from um, our sister Brene Brown, but I think that is the key that unlocks all of the things that we want as human beings uh, and as men. Love is is the key to that. Mm, and vulnerability is the vehicle. Great. Um, so the end goal, right? Healthy masculinity. Yeah. Um, you've talked about what a good man is. We've talked a bit about what healthy masculinity would look like and how to get there. Um, how is all of this complicated by intersecting identities um, when it comes to race, sexuality, other identities? How, it, how does that complicate things? Yeah, very much so. Um, you know, when I first launched uh, The Lives of Men and I kind of set out to have this conversation, um, I quickly learned that you can't have that conversation, uh, meaning uh, unpacking what it means to be a man without also having a conversation around mental health uh, and the intersectional impacts of of patriarchy, if you will, and how that shows up in various communities. And so, you know, whether it's yeah, the, the patriarchal um, effects of uh, toxic masculinity on the trans community or the LGBTQ community or on, on women in cis hetero relationships uh, in, in the advents of, of violence that you're seeing. Uh, I'm not sure if folks on the on the call have seen, you know, at least in New York, just recently we saw uh, a 19 year old twin girl stabbed uh, because she resisted the the oncomings of a young man, right? And so the, when you start to, when you see those things, um, you realize that um, that is the ways that, uh, those, are, that's, those are examples of the ways that um, patriarchy and masculinity not only harm the the victim in this case, but also the, the young man, you know, whoever that might be. And so, you know, what I say with all this, and the reason I, I'm so passionate about this is because, of course, as a man, as a Black man, as a man who shows up in the world a specific way, I'm very aware of how my identity um, is perceived. Um, but I'm also very aware of how my presence makes other people feel. So if I will, uh, if I step into a room and it's a room full of women, I'm very aware of not maybe taking up too much space or using my voice in a softer way because I don't want to make people feel uncomfortable. But that's just my own uh, identity. And that's how, you know, my own expression um, of masculinity is, is how I toggle that because I don't want to inadvertently make someone uncomfortable. That's just an example of how me and my kind of identity, um, how that intersects, uh, whereas perhaps a white man may not have that consideration. So those are just intricate, you know, kind of nuances that uh, show up when it comes to 
cultural intersectional um uh com the, the cultural intersectional conversation as it relates to masculinity that we have to be aware of is that you know identity uh background etc all of that contributes to how we show up and you're touching upon stereotypes, right, that we have about various groups to intersectional identities. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you as a storyteller, as someone who is in the storytelling space, uh, about the power of storytelling to promote healthy masculinity. How do you do that in your work? Um, what are the effects of that? What is the potential impact of storytelling and shaping our culture? You know, little questions. <laughs> little questions. So, yeah, I mean, what you're alluding to, for those that don't know, or um, is that I'm I'm the Chief Diversity Officer at BBDO. Uh, and part of my job, of course, is to build culture internally, but also to help shape the stories that we tell on behalf of our brands. And so if my premise and my uh, thesis is that if creativity is an economic multiplier for, for our brands and for us as an agency, then diversity and inclusion is the lifeblood that powers that creativity, right? So by definition, we should be in the business of telling inclusive stories that are nuanced, that uh, depict communities in, in responsible ways and fair ways and not leading into stereotypes and tropes. And so as it relates to this conversation around masculinity, one of the ways that I looked for our teams to work with our clients and our brands uh, um, to, to kind of address some of this conversation is, you know, how are we, you know, from a representation standpoint, that's low hanging fruit is, you know, how are we, who are we putting in front of the camera? Who are we working with behind the camera? So that's, that's, table stakes in my view at this point. Uh, the real conversation is uh, what is the story that we're trying to tell such that when a young woman is watching this particular piece of work, is she gonna see herself represented there? Um, is she gonna feel inspired by it? Um, is he gonna feel inspired by it? Um, and, and is he gonna see himself in it such that it, it sets in motion um, a series of events that hopefully uh, impacts that person as they move forward? Um, so I think it, it really is making sure that the stories that we're telling are nuanced, that they are responsible, that they're not leaning into tropes, um, but more importantly, that they're challenging um, these norms of, of the ways that we are as a society. Um, I, one of my favorite ads that recently came out uh, was an audible ad that was making fun of this, you know, kind of, did you see that one? I did. Yeah. Um, I've done that. Kind of yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, you did. Oh, well, there you go. It's it's a great ad because it kind of shows, um, and maybe you can drop the link in the chat at some point. I think people should see it, but it's a um, great piece of work that kind of challenges uh, this new idea of, of masculinity, but but it really does show, you know, kind of the importance of um, having these conversations, you know, perhaps even in a humorous way, but at least engaging in this conversation. Yes, and I'll drop a link during the Q&A, and that's a great reminder, folks. Put your questions in the Q&A. We're almost there. Um, so, Jason, you talked about your role internally as well, fostering this environment. So, obviously, there's the public-facing part of it. But talk to us about what you, what you do in the workspace, how you create inclusive workspaces, what employers can do, how healthy masculinity ties into that. Yeah, Um you know, as a leader, I realized that, um, you know, I have incredible privilege as a leader, even as a black man, as a part of a marginalized community, um, I still benefit from male privilege. And I also benefit from, in this case, hierarchical, hierarchical privilege, privilege in the organization. And so what I often advocate for inside the workplace is allyship, allyship, number one, and allyship in terms of it being a a series of acts and steps and a body of work that you build over time that demonstrates your commitment to making room and making space for women, for, for marginalized communities across the board. Uh, and sometimes that means physical space. Sometimes that means, you know, I might be asked to participate in a panel um, and I may just say, you know what, while I may, I may have something great to contribute here, I think this other person may have something better to contribute or perhaps her voice needs to be heard. Uh, and so it's sometimes giving up my seat in a, in a very physical way um, for that. So I think that's how it starts. You know, it's really th being mindful of ways that you can actually demonstrate and spend privilege uh, in a way that advances um, folks that, that might not have a similar platform. Ah, wonderful. Okay. Um, one thing you wish you knew as a young boy uh, or young man about masculinity, what would you tell your younger self? Some words of wisdom. Trust yourself. 
um trust yourself trust i believe in that so much that i actually tattooed it on my on my finger here so i can see it every day um trust yourself and trust that you are in the room because you uh you deserve to be there um and because god sent you into that room and don't ever underestimate the value that you bring uh to the world um uh, but to every space that you occupy um and i think that's important because you know especially when you think about young boys who grew up without a father figure in the home or or a consistent father figure that sense of confidence and self esteem is not there from the beginning so it's something that you build over time and so for me it was you know a constant reminder and constant work or labor of love to remind myself that I am enough uh, and that I belong. And uh, and if I'm in a room, it's because I deserve to be there. And so it's just, had I known that, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I think my life would have been completely different. Ah, yes. So the confidence, right, that, yeah. that component. Um, let's jump into some questions. I see some great ones coming in. Mark asks, how, if, if at all, do the present ideas of masculinity serve black male humanity as we experience it today. Run that by me again. How? How, if at all, do the present ideas of masculinity, so hegemonic masculinity, yeah, yeah. Or the norms, how do they serve Black male humanity as we experience it today? Not at all. Um, not at all. I think, you know, when you think about uh, what we're asked to do um, and, and all of the kind of traits that we, that society says is, is a man, right? So being stoic, being unemotive, being unaffected by the world around you, all of those are in my book, symptoms of depression as well, mm -hmm. right? So when you're despondent, when you're, you know, kind of disconnected from the world and from your livelihood or from your, from that joy de vivre, if you will, I think that those are, I don't think those are things to be proud of. So it doesn't serve us. And I think on top of that, when you consider uh, for black men and men of color in particular, uh, the the importance um, and the life and death nature in a very real sense of um, moving around the world and interacting with uh, law enforcement or or different uh, social structures, you know, what we what we're taught um, in terms of how to behave um, is not serving us, is not keeping us alive. And so I think part of, of what we need to relearn or unlearn and then learn something new is what does it mean to be in these spaces and, and live into and speak into and breathe into our fullest expression of humanity uh, that is nuanced, that, it, that, in, that has softness, that is strong, that is complex. All of those things are things that I think we need to, you know, learn in order to kind of... Um, reshape or reframe what we hope healthier masculinity looks like in the future. And Jason, if you're a black man or you're a man of color watching, um, what resources would you recommend? How can somebody maybe join a group or read something that can help them tap into that? Yeah, I love it. Yeah, you put me on the spot because there's so many things that I've, I'm like, yeah, right, what do I say first? But what's coming to me at just the top of my head and I'll, I'm happy to, um, uh, share with you some some stuff that I don't know if you want to email folks afterwards, but Absolutely. One book, yeah, one book that I think um, is is gold uh, for folks is a book by the, a, a gentleman uh, by the name of Terrence Real, um, Terry Real. He wrote, um, I don't want to talk about it. Um, title says says it all right. But it's really a great articulation of the intersection between mental health and masculinity and how it all comes together and why it's all it's inextricably linked um and then one of the things that comes out from that book i know this is not part of the question but i just thought i'd share is that he looked at a study where he looked at um, boys and girls under the age of four and he realized that boys under the age of four were actually as if not more emotive than girls at that age so you beg the question what well, what happens at that age well that's when you start to hear well man up boys don't cry and all of these things that separate us from these emotions and so it's an, an incredible book um and i would say it's probably um one of the, one of my favorites in the space and then of course dear men on yahoo news um selfish selfish plug really check it out folks please you know it's a life changer and it's interesting this ties in with something that ted bunch was saying in a previous interview um it's it's not just that they're being told not to be emotive right they're being told that being emotive is like being a girl and so there's this kind of homophobia and sexism that kind of binds this box together um and jason you write so eloquently about this in in your own work so please check it out folks 
Amanda has a question. I work with men at San Quentin who have grown up with toxic masculinity. You were able to look the men in to look the men in your life to know that you did not want to be that way, right? So you looked around and knew that. How are you able to have the moral courage to make the decision? And how do we help our youth have the same moral courage? Yeah, I mean, I, I consider myself very lucky. Um, I knew, I always knew I wanted more. I, and again, I think one of the things I said earlier was uh, I'm also the product of a single parent home um, led by a really, really strong um, woman, my mom. And so she came to this country first in our family to come to this country. And so I had an example of what hard work looks like, what ambition looks like, what uh, sacrifice looked like. So I had the the foundation and the bedrock of you know, the success factors, if you will. Uh, and then on top of that was all I needed to do was to say, you know, or believe that I wanted more. And she constantly fed that into me and constantly kind of, you know, provide that feedback. So, you know, I, I was very lucky to have that. Um, and then I had, of course, great mentors, great uh, teachers in school. Um, I was in sports, you know, so I think that's, that's, I guess, where I'm headed with respect to what I said earlier about boys not having support systems. I grew up at a time when you could still go to your local YMCA, sign up for a basketball team, and then now you have community, you know, or you you would come home and instead of, you know, jumping on the computer for eight hours, you would go outside and play until the lights came down. So you, you had elements of community built into the ways that you lived your life. And so I was just very lucky um, to have that and lean into that. Well, and Larissa has a follow-up question, very well-timed. How can we teach our boys that being vulnerable leads to physical and emotional well-being if all they see and hear in the media is that boys don't cry? In addition to The Mask We Live In, which is the film that uh, the Representation Project put out in 2015, Jen's film. Um, in addition to The Mask We Live In, what other media materials do you recommend to moms to make our boys aware that there are alternative and healthier ways to live their masculinity? Big question. Um, what was the first part of that question? Sorry. The first was about how can we teach our boys to be vulnerable? Um, yeah, vulnerability. Um, yeah, I think it's redefining vulnerability. You know, to your point, I think you said earlier, it's 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 not a, a, a mark of weakness. It's actually a key that unlocks a greater thing. Um, so vulnerability. I think, un unfortunately, I do speak to a lot of men um, who feel as though the women in their lives don't create a safe space for them to be vulnerable. So I would say, I'm assuming this person is a, a, a woman or, or identifies as, as a woman. Um, I'm going to say that it's as important for the women in boys' lives to not police them in the same ways that we police each other. And I think that's a, uh, another consequence of patriarchy is that uh, women have, have been impacted just in the same way. And so, uh, and we don't realize how often um, women uh, create harm uh, for, for young men and boys and, and et cetera. And so I would say, be mindful of the ways that you are policing his masculinity um, or his ways of being um, and and then and creating a safe space for him to then be vulnerable and share. Uh, and then in terms of uh, media outlets, um, you know, a, a call to men, Ted Bunch's organization, um, I, I'm thinking about uh, what's that well, man enough the show that was I don't know if it's still running, but that was a, a Baldoni. Really, mm -hmm. yeah, with Justin Baldoni. I mean, those there those are just some examples of um, really great uh, forums for for dialogue around this conversation yeah absolutely and there are i ted lasso there are all sorts of yeah you know i love some of the new content coming out um camille asks often and understandably so emphasis is placed on the role of fathers and how they contribute to the development of the healthy masculinity in boys and young men that said as a mom of a young boy what additional ways can we contribute or support the development of healthy masculinity in our son perhaps pulling from your own experience and what ways did your mom contribute to, to your development into the manual are today? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say my mom was uh, she, as great as she was. I don't think she always had the best tactics. Um, but, you know, in, in some ways, her her approach was tough love, right? Her approach was, you know, I got to be tougher on you because you're the oldest and you're the man and you got to do this and you got to do that. And so that that <laughs> that had some side effects that I'm still working through today as a man. But, um, you know, in some ways it helped. But I would say, you know, if you are a single mom or if you're a mom of boys, you know, think about ways that you can actually bring the male presence in. You know, of course, you can always be supportive and try to listen and learn. 
but try to be creative in terms of bringing the the male presence in, whether it's signing them up for a coach. If you're, your, your kid is taking swim lessons, uh, you know, please advocate for a male coach or a male instructor, um, you know, go to the school and find ways to, you know, connect them with the male guidance counselor, whoever it is, but try to introduce more and more male presence, consistent male presence in their lives. Um, and if you have a great solid group of, of male friends in your life, you know, ask them if they'd be willing to, you know, take your boy out to the museum or, you know, things like that. I think it's really important for us to lean in, into community here and, you know, it's the age old adage, right? It takes a village. Um, so I would say lean into that village. Yes. And then positive male role models, right? Yeah. Um, Barbara asks about a specific social media person, influencer. Have you ever heard of Cyzorg? He's a positive masculinity influencer on Instagram. He is brilliant. And I have begun using his content with college age students I'm teaching. Have not heard of uh, Cyzorg, but you know what? We'll check, we'll check them out. Um, mm. Gerardo asks, I am grateful for the expressions made here today. Taking self-inventory and doing the work has been very destabilizing for me at times, being that white male heteronormatives are so central to male identity today. Have you experienced the same? And what advice do you have for us on that path? Yeah, I have experienced the same. Um, I would say that there was a point in time, and 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 sometimes even in relationship, I I would say uh, with my with my partners, I would say, you know, you don't really want a man who is emotive or expressive, right? Because when you do get that, it becomes less about what I'm feeling and what I'm saying I'm feeling, and more about how you're feeling, you know. And so I think it's this this idea that I think um, Bell Hooks once said it, you know, at two thirty on Wednesday, if all men in the world you know, start to scream, I'm hurt and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, you know, women are all over the place will start to run because uh, we, they just won't know what to do with it. But I think that's tongue in cheek, but I do think that there's an element of that, um, that essence of, you know, if we are in relationship, um, to what degree are we creating safe spaces for men to be their fullest expression um, and express that? And I think that to me is my challenge, you know, not only to men, but also to, to, people who are in relationship with men as well, um, is to uh, really interrogate ourselves and, and really ask how are we furthering harm uh, inadvertently or, or otherwise, um, and, and how do we course correct? Thank you, Jason. Um, Duncan asks, have you had any success getting through to conservative or guarded men who are resistant to this kind of growth? Yeah, I think that is the million dollar question. You know, I, I would say that everyone on this call is of like mind, like minded, you know, spirit and, you know, the, the impact that we're going to make on calls like these are marginal, right? We're already on this wavelength, right? So the real challenge is how do we get the dude on the corner or the dude that's whatever it, that that isn't necessarily in, in this wave to think differently? And I think it's a matter of, um you know, understanding them first, right? Understanding their perspective, understanding what kind of their story is, and really articulating with it through the lens of what they're experiencing, what we're trying to what we're trying to say. And 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 really, this isn't about the flowery language that we use, right? This is fundamentally about creating stronger community, um, having men show up, take responsibility for themselves in their communities. And that to me should be the, the basis of any conversation around what is masculinity. It's about men taking ownership of themselves and showing up as leaders in their communities, whatever that community may look like. And that, and that to me is probably the beginnings of that conversation. Yeah, that sounds like a, a position I think a lot of conservative men might embrace, right? So finding that common ground, thank you. Um, and Tommy asks a similar question, but maybe some concrete tips here. Um, they say, I'm currently working as a health, healthy masculinity educator. What tips or points do you think are the most pertinent to get across through our work? I would want to understand first who's the audience. Um, is it young men? Is it, you know, it, it depends. Um, I would say self-worth is important. Uh, Self-awareness is important. It always starts with the person themselves. It's, you know, oftentimes we talk about uh, these the healings and modes of 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 operating that are kind of external fo focused, you know, how do we engage relative to, you know, and I think for us, this conversation has to be self-driven first and foremost. And so, you know, in your work, if you're inspiring methods for self-reflection, uh, self, uh, self interrogation, um, uh, responsibility, discipline, you know, these are, these are the types of, um, 
attributes, if you will, or virtues that we want to have young men think about as as valuable, not just how much money am I going to make um, when I'm older, you know, so I think we need to start to teach them the benefits of these earlier on. So I would say start there. Great. Okay. Um, Kevin asked about uh, the resources you have shared. Don't worry, you'll get an email as well as linking it to the video, all the resources that Jason has mentioned. Uh, but Kevin has a, a great question as well. Uh, please discuss the intersectionality of the trauma of the post-trans Atlantic slave trade, post-incarceration syndrome, and the school-to-prison pipeline. How can we teach vulnerability in a super hyper-toxic masculine society? Man, that's that's a whole nother webinar, right? Um, <laughs> he gave me post transatlantic slave trade and prison to pipeline. I mean, I think all of these, all of these systems um, have perpetuated uh, this idea of men needing to be strong. Whether it's you know uh, enslaved Africans coming in and only the strongest being worthy or, or thought of as worthy to be sold and you know kind of worked and, and traded. Um, all the way through to the the prison to college pipeline um, vortex, this idea that you know men have to demonstrate strength uh, through violence and through, or, or that the only valuable, the only acceptable way that we can emote um, is through anger and violence. All of that perpetuates this idea of this very reductive idea of what masculinity is, and so I think. That's that's how these systems have been set up and, and they continue to perpetuate. So our challenge is how do we disrupt that and teach something different? You know, and that starts before they've gotten through that that process and that pipeline is how do we start uh, at, at a very young age teaching them, you know, what it means to be a man and the values and the virtues of what that looks like holistically. Mm, love that. OK, Sarah asks, this is a, a shift. Uh, gears here. Sarah asked, my first job was the post girl at BBDO in London. I now run a theater company using interactive theater and diversity, equity, and inclusion, currently working on a campaign called Stronger Together, funded by the Home Office to combat violence against women and girls. Stronger Together because we want to empower men and boys to make change in attitudes, presumptions, and toxic masculinity. We are finding it difficult to engage boys and men to talk about what they need to move the conversation forward. What are your thoughts about how to get them talking, please? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we're in a world where men and boys are afraid of saying and doing the wrong thing. And so don't discount that, the, the fact that, you know, men and boys are tired and afraid of, of leaning into one, one direction or the other. So I would say that, you know, acknowledge that. The second thing is, um, as it relates to bringing men and boys as out, along as allies, I think part of it is understanding that the world is different and, and they care about different things. Um, and so how do we tap into what they care about the most? And what they care about the most right now, um, I would say, is is a less uh, a vision for of success for their future in terms of how much money they're going to make and all that. It's it's really the acceptance of their peers that they care the most about. Mm -hmm. So how do you lean into that uh, as a vehicle to draw them closer and draw them into this conversation? So um, I would say that that's probably without without knowing too much and kind of off the top of my head, I would say lean into their their desire and their need for connection and community as a way to bring them in. And maybe some pure ambassadors would do exactly that, right? A few who are committed with them. Maybe yeah. pull others in. Um, Anon Anonymous asks, have you noticed meaningful change in the advertising world when it comes to depictions of masculinity? I have. Um, imperfect, but I have. Um, I think, you know, thinking back a few years ago, there was a Gillette ad that came out um, that was really polarizing. Um, and I think we've come a long way since that, um, that kind of heavy handed telling men that we're behaving badly uh, type of messaging to a more nuanced, maybe humorous conversation around what is it, what it, what are men thinking about? What, what do we care about? So I think we have made progress, but I think there's still much more progress to be made um, because I think it, representation alone and, you know, kind of table stakes conversations alone won't move the needle. I think if, again, if we have the power to change the world that we live in and inspire to live in, then we need to go a step further and say, what is possible, right? What are the new conversations that need to be have, um, that we need to be having in order to encourage men to change behavior? And I don't think we're there yet. Mm, okay, so Vicky asks, ties into that about language. 
Um, as a parent of a transgender child, it's been striking to me in her transition how gendered all of our language and expectations are without any real need. Do you feel like using gender neutral language and having representations of people without so much focus on gender could help move the needle away from stereotypes and toxicity? Yeah, I think it does. Um, I, I also do think that sometimes we get so caught up in language and, and you know, uh, terms and all that. I think we get lost uh, in the spirit of what we're trying to do, which is to convey to someone that we see them and that we hold their identity um, you know, in, high, in in regard, right, that we are regarding them. And so I think, you know, yes, it, it's important for us to understand the language, understand, you know, how to uh, engage in the language uh, that certain communities kind of gravitate to. But I also think it's important for us not to lose sight of what we're trying to do, which is, you know, to build connection uh, and, and make sure that people are feeling seen. Mm. Um, last substantive question. With your vast experience, and this is from Anonymous, your vast experience working in DEI, so diversity, equity, and inclusion, how are DEI initiatives getting it right or wrong when it comes to addressing gender norms and stereotypes? And I will just add a question to that, which is the broader environment and now the challenges to DEI. So what is DEI doing great and could do better? And then what do you see on the horizon for new kind of legal challenges against DEI work? I'll start with the latter. Um, I'm afraid, and I, I have this conversation with my peers often, that we are one Supreme Court decision away from what we do being illegal. And so, you know, and that is a very, that's that's true statement. That's not conjecture. And so for me, you know, what I want to see us do, those of us who are practitioners of this work, is think about if the pendulum has swung back to what we're used to it being, right, this kind of divesting from DNI and the attack on DNI. And eventually we'll know, like as everything does, kind of the pendulum will swing back. When it swings back in our, in our favor, right, quote unquote, and in the direction of positive momentum, what is the conversation that we should be having or prepared to have at that point? And to me, the conversation should not be about representation. To me, that's stable stakes. We know that representation, diverse representation matters. It's important across every metric that you can pull. So from that standpoint is we need to really graduate the conversation, the, the DEI conversation away from where it is today to a much more future forward, innovative uh, forward thinking type of conversation. <clears throat> and then uh, as far as what we, where I think we've done well, or perhaps what we haven't done as well is, you know, we we have talked a lot about, I'm starting to see a lot of programs and, and even employee resource groups emerge specifically focused on men uh, or for men. Um, so I'm starting to see that across different organizations. I'm starting to see, uh, you know, this, uh, the idea of allyship actually being uh, enacted and kind of more, more consistently applied, not just between men and women, but in an intersectional way, right? So ERGs that are focused on, for example, Black communities are intersecting and, and acknowledging Afro-Latinos by working with Latino-based ERGs. So there's this cross-pollination of conversation and ideas that I'm really happy to see, um, but I think there's still more work to be done, for sure. Right. Um... Jason Rosario, where can folks find you? How can we support your work? Yeah, I mean, social media, uh, LinkedIn, you can find me there. Just type my name in. I'm sure you can find it. Um, I would say so. Uh, uh, LinkedIn, LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, Twitter, it's all Jason two underscores Rosario. Um, and then Dear Men on Yahoo News, look that up really proud of that work, uh, interviewed folks like Kevin Love and Swiss Beats and others, really um, unpacking this conversation around masculinity beyond what you would expect them to talk about, right? Whether it's their their sport, their work, et cetera, we really got into, um, you know, their humanness as men. And so I, I'm really proud of that work. So check that out there. Ah, yes, it really is an impressive body of work. I hope folks will use it in their classrooms, use it in their resource as resources in um, employee groups, affinity groups. Um, Jason Rosario, thank you so much for your time today, my friend, and for your work. And we'll see you all soon. Thank you all for coming.